confronted with yourself. And I think in today's day and age, people don't believe that, that we have to be confronted. Um, you yeah. know, was, we've been talking a little bit about the white horse in this podcast that we like to listen to mm-hmm. um, by Michael Horton. And they're going through the five solas. And I think we're going to do the same thing here um, soon in the future. But they do these interviews and one of the interviews that they did were interviewing people outside of a Christian conference. And it was amazing to see that these people who claim to be Christians, um, even out after this conference, were asked questions like, do you believe that that people are good or that people are bad? Do you believe that people are essentially good? And I was amazed at the amount of people that said, yes, yeah, we're essentially good. We're born good. And it just depends on how we're raised. And, and so, you know, when you say that, you know, you were confronted, you know, as you're sharing your story about how you came, you know, to know Jesus and, uh, God brought salvation to your life. Um, you know, I noticed you're confronted by the truth. By the word of God, like the word of God is what grabbed your heart and showed you probably the truest you and who you need to be before God. And I, when I think about myself and my story is that I am a sinner in need of a savior and then I need to repent. And I think repentance is that first fruit of a saved person's life that shows that, yes, you do belong to God now. Yeah. Um, the gospel is a gospel of repentance unto salvation. Yeah. Well, there's, and that's one of the reasons why I bring up that even presently, you know, in both our lives personally, uh, but also any true believer is going to wrestle with the reality that they are on a walk of continued sanctification. You know, people, you know, we know the classic response at church. Hey, how you doing? Oh, blessed brother. I'm doing so good, you know, or whatever. Yeah. You know, I, on that note, I kind of, I don't know if you've noticed, I, I made a point over the last several years to, uh, when people ask me how I'm doing, I say, I say, I'm okay. I'm yeah. okay. And <laughs> I was recently asked about the same response. You know, I'll, I'll say yeah. I'm doing all right. And it's just all right. Yep. Just all right. You're not blessed. <laughs> Christ hasn't died for your sins and you're not, you know, and I go, you know, he is, but I'm kind of giving, uh, I'm opening up the dialogue so that if something in your life isn't perfect, honky dory, <laughs> um, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it because we all have our own stresses and though we are saved and we have the joy in our hearts now that's provided by God sharing his joy with us. Um, we're also being sanctified. We're being changed daily and we're also struggling daily through, through things in life. And so, um, I, it's kind of my effort personally, when people ask me, like, Hey, how are you doing? I go, Hey, I'm okay. Yeah. You know, and sometimes I'll tell people like, Hey, I've got complaints, but it's not worth talking about, you know, God's still good. But, uh, if you want to hear, I can, I can, <laughs> I can share those things with you. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just my effort to open up the dialogue to say, Hey, let's have a real conversation. Let's talk about our lives, um, together. Let's help each other get closer to Jesus. And yeah, well, so you think back and you go, okay, who are some of the, some of the guys that we like to read who are real and desiring to help believers have a stronger walk with the Lord. One of the best books on that topic was, uh, that I read is, uh, by John Owen called of the mortification of sin in believers and, uh, just a, a heavy hitting, um, you know, confronting of the continued need for sanctification and purity in the life of the believer. So it's not a, I think sometimes when believers have these kinds of conversations, people might look at it and go, well, you know, maybe they're, you know, they're wrestling with sin in their lives. And and it's like, no, this is just the reality of walking with the Lord is the closer we walk to Jesus, the more we are exposed to our own sin and wretchedness and just going like Paul, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? We want to be as, as, uh, as close to Jesus as we can. But when we look at the reality of who we are in the flesh, um, we see things like, like I mentioned in Galatians, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Paul writes, 
Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. Notice he keeps going. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revileries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, gentleness. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Powerful. Uh, because we go, man, I want those fruits of the spirit to be what are evident in my life and not the things that are the fruits of the flesh. Uh, you People will know who you are. Uh, that is, they'll know that you're a follower of Christ by the fruit that is coming out of your life. And so we want to walk in the spirit. And uh, it's a big, big difference from from where we once were. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think, <laughs> like you said, that fruit, the truth confronts you, confronts, confronts, confronts you like that. You've I was confronted by the fruit of my life. <laughs> I'm Have hungry. Have you been confronted by Jesus? Have you been confronted lately, brother? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we're confronted by the truth and the truth shows us the rottenness of the fruit in our life. But also when we see that bad news that there, we are sinners, the good news of the gospel comes in and shows us, but Jesus has come to save you, but God has provided a way into salvation. I think, you know, um, sharing my story, you know, when I, Raised in a Christian home, as far as my parents were, were great Christian people and still are to this day, great examples. Um, but I didn't believe, you know, I don't think we believed. I think it was something we did because we had to. But I remember when I was, I think I was 17, maybe uh, going to a, a Christian conference retreat. And I remember the first fruit of salvation in my life when God gave me the gift of repentance that he convicted me of my sin um, I was sitting in a group of people after a session at this thing and all of a sudden it was like I wasn't hearing anybody else there I, I like God was speaking directly to me his word and just showing me how big of a sinner I was and I remember just breaking down crying it was the first time I think I admitted to God that I'm lost and I need you and I'm a sinner. And I remember after that moment, you know, just feeling like a new creation, like, wow, God is real. God really does take away our sins. And I remember that, that moment of repentance and how much joy it brought to me of bringing off that weight. And this was a young, young kid, myself coming from a background of just, just doing stupid things like most of us do in our youth. Um, but for me personally, even going through thoughts of suicide and the desire to take my life and feeling so empty. And for the first time when I was confronted with God saying, you are empty because of your sin, because you're idolizing, you're placing your, your hope and your desires in these pointless things that, that can't fulfill you, that can't save you, that are not eternal and allowing me the gift of repentance to say, repent and be saved. Like Jesus told so many people, um, go and sin no more. It was that invitation to say, hey, I see you where you're at, um, but I'm going to accept you by my grace. And I think one of the verses that, that really always stuck with me as a young man, and I'll kind of lead this into the next segue of how did you end up going from there to where you're at today? Um you know, how'd you go from being that person, um, young guy kicking yourself out of your parents' house, out of our parents' house, um, to moving back in with them, to seeing Stephanie now, who's your wife, um, walking with Jesus to now pastoring a church. How did you get called into ministry? One of the verses that spoke to me in that moment and for the next probably couple of years really powerfully was Matthew 16, 
in verse 24 of Matthew 16, it says, and then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? And I love that. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And it was really an invitation out of your old life to say, you can leave all of that behind. Life's not about you. When you live to glorify God and focus on him, there your life is most fulfilled because you're living for eternity. And I think from then on, for me, kind of the rest is history. My my before Christ and after Christ now living for him um, story has just been so transformed by that verse. Um, but how did you end up going from from that place to feeling either called to ministry or how did you get there? That's a good question. Um, you know, after graduating, my senior year was my best because I was walking with the Lord and uh, seeing, you know, people kind of s- hungry for. I can remember one guy going, "What like, what's what's happened to you?" and uh, and it wasn't a a weird thing. It was just like a man. You're different than you were. And, uh, so that's what made senior year, uh, really enjoyable is I now was living with a purpose and the purpose wasn't just the next exciting thing, the next, you know, alcohol binge night or, you know, whatever it was recognizing. And I wouldn't say I knew this then, but I recognize it now that now my life was to be lived to the glory of God. And uh, I'm kind of laughing because I, I'm kind of laughing because I realized when you said my senior year living as a Christian, we both ended up in the same alternative high school. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So both, people knew when you were different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Other than that, I know my wife pulling into the parking lot at that school she was kind of freaked out to do so because there's like <laughs> high schoolers hanging on to the yeah. roof of cars and smoking their cigarettes out in the yeah. parking lot, uh, handkerchiefs soaked in gasoline <laughs> lit on fire. And, um, and if you yeah. don't know what an alternative high school is, it's where they send all the bad kids. This is like <laughs> your last chance. Like if you can't make it here, we're done with you. And they, they sent yeah. the teachers like that there too. So it was a good, <laughs> it was a good combination, but but yep. it was it was a good part of our testimony that uh, here we are, two transformed guys who kind of were, were just going down that path. It brought us to that place and that school. <laughs> yeah. And here we were trying to live out our faith as Christians, high school Christians. Yeah. And so going from that school to back to, uh, you know, being in church and and uh, finding ourselves then then we found ourselves at a Calvary Chapel where, um, you know, we had some really just awesome guys our age that were walking with Jesus and pointing us to the Lord and talking about Bible college and things like that. And so for me, um, I didn't have a plan. I didn't have a five year plan. I didn't have a plan that included college. And so I, I heard that there was a Bible college and decided, hey, how do I go there? I want to sign up. And so both me and my my then girlfriend, my now wife, signed up. We were accepted to the college, went to the Bible college. And uh, it's interesting. Um, and I can't deny, deny that God worked in this way. Uh, while I was there in my Genesis class, there was an elderly woman who was attending the class. I think she was, what do you call that when you're just, you're just attending. She was auditing. Yeah. She was like auditing the class. And so she sat by Stephanie and I, and, uh, you know, it was during a confusing time where I'm going, should I be with this girl? I don't know. I'm so confused. Was she really from God? And, and all of that. And this elderly woman leaned over during our class and told Stephanie, he's going to be a pastor. 
and uh, I have no idea how she had knew that or you know it, whatever. it was the Shekinah around the Shekinah head. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no but she. she